thank you for coming to Fish Tales. Um, it's wonderful to see just such a tremendous audience for this wonderful show, I Am More, with Amy Kerr. The next two Fish Tales are October 19th, and that's going to be here. Uh, the theme is Deadline. And our big fundraiser of the year at the Gloucester Stage Company, November 30th. The theme is Oh My God. <laughs> And I would say that's with an exclamation point. It's really OMG exclamation point. Uh, I'd like to turn it over to Nikon Rishan Show, who is our guest host. Welcome. Hello and welcome. I'm really honored to be the guest host of Fish Tales. I love the whole idea of Fish Tales, Gloucester's version of the moth. Um, I am a story receiver and a storyteller by nature and by profession. And I really believe in the healing power of stories. I've seen it, and I believe that stories can be told through words, through painting, through movement, and even through silence. So thank you so much for being here. And also thank you to all of our readers. We have six storytellers tonight. So I'm really excited to hear them all. I just want to say a little bit about the theme of tonight's program. It's based on the extraordinary work of Amy Kerr. Amy is the founder of I Am More, which is a public art and writing project based on the idea that we are more than our suffering, more than our physical and emotional selves. I Am More is a series of striking portraits accompanied by personal stories. Amy says we are more than our losses, our traumas, our diseases, our addictions. We are lovers, we are healers and dreamers and storytellers. If you haven't had the opportunity to see the show, you really should. It's just beautiful. And it's going to be coming up in October. Is it at, is it at City Hall still? It's coming to action in October. And then um, the Addison Gilbert Hospital Cafeteria in November and Magnolia Library in December. So our first storyteller is Romani Rangan. He is a yoga instructor, an artist, and a Gloucester resident. So please welcome Romani Rangan. Hi. Hi. Oh. <laughs> so I need some help here. So what I want you to do, if you would, Put your hands like this, arms together, and imagine that you have a little two to three week old baby in your arms. And that maybe you're just giving a little movement like this. So holding it there, I want you, if you would, close your eyes. And I want you to imagine <clears throat> that you're a, a young parent And you're alone in a room with the baby, and the baby is sleeping. And then I want you to imagine that there is a loud sound. It's a siren. And then in the background, you hear the drone of planes coming over. And getting louder and louder and louder. And all of a sudden, there are bums that are falling. And you're scared, you're afraid. And you hold tight to your baby. And then the bums come close, and they come so close that when they explode, they blast, and the windows go in. And you hold onto your baby, and you fall to the floor with the blast. That's my mother holding me in 1941. You can open your eyes now. So I spent the first four years of my life in London during the Blitz. There was poverty. There were many things that were happening. All around me, there were people that were challenged, losing people, bombed out buildings. That was my playground. So many things happened after that. Good things, where we got together with what, what little we had. And we shared that. So now we're going to fast forward to when I'm 26. 
I'm successfully working in Denmark in the theater doing lighting. How I got from 19, from London theater and television, from all the things that I feel I've experienced. Sure, I'm right here. Yeah. <laughs> Eyes down, 23. Okay, so um, at 26, I had a breakdown on the stage during a rehearsal. I just went and fell to the ground and started to go into convulsions. And um, when I came out of that, they recommended I go to a psychiatrist. So they gave me the address, and so I went up to this place where it was, and it was this incredible building like a palace. This is in Copenhagen, Denmark in the center of a town, and I walk in, and his apartment, just the one room, was bigger than all the last three apartments that I'd stayed in put together. And so he started to talk to me, and I was kind of getting some of the things he was saying, but it was as if he was talking about somebody else. And then he said, what would you like to do? Uh, do you like to play an instrument? And I said, well, I play a little bit of piano. So then he took me into another room, which was just as big, and he had, a, he had a grand piano. And he said, play. So I tinkered a little bit, and then he said to me, you know, you'll never be professional. <laughs> so then I decided <clears throat> that I would leave this gentleman <laughs> so that he could pursue his own future. But I knew when I walked out that I was in trouble and I had to do something. So I went to my little apartment and I decided that I was going to make my apartment my hospital room. So I painted the place white. I took all the curtains down and put white curtains down on. I went out and I got art supplies, music instruments that I've never played before. And I locked myself in that apartment for three months. And when I came out of that, I was more. It happened. And here I am now, and being even more. <laughs> so thank you so much for listening to our story. It's not just mine, it's also yours. Thank you. Thank you, Romani. I can tell thank you is not really going to cut it, because I th that was just beautiful. Thank you for telling that story. OK, next up is Hattie Mae Rich. She is a senior at Rockport High School and an award-winning actress with the Boston Children's Theater. Please welcome Hattie Mae. Um, <laughs> Hi. Um, so yeah, I'm an actress, but I'm not very comfortable on stage as myself, so this is like a lot. Um, so I just want to like take a little time. Um, my story starts four years ago. Um, I lost my dad. Uh, <laughs> he was a lot to me, so... I just kind of want to spread his joy and his impact on me. Um, so sixth grade, I didn't really have a lot of friends and leading up to that. And I never really noticed that, I guess, until now. Um, he was really like my best friend. And I, I didn't really need anything else than him, I guess. Um, he was there for me night and day. Uh, we would go on car rides, secret motorcycle rides, because if my mom found out, she would kill us both. <laughs> um, <laughs> we did everything. We went for walks every Sunday, the candy store. I always dragged him in. Um, we would go pick up sea glass. And I guess as I got older, it started becoming more evident that life isn't always happy and 
though he was my happiness all the time, I never saw him cry. I never saw him sad, I guess. Um, it became clear to me that there were other things in life that were obstacles. And I guess what we found easier for us was we really just took ourselves out of reality a lot. And what we did was we designed our own boat. <laughs> and our future was to sail everywhere and live nowhere and yet everywhere all at the same time. And my 12-year-old self was like, whoa, this is great. <laughs> <laughs> we had the biggest boat I could ever imagine. There was a bowling alley, <laughs> a movie theater, a shopping mall. <laughs> there were hundreds of cooks and like crew members that we really didn't have to do anything but enjoy life. And I like to think that that's where he is, somewhere just in the middle of the ocean, chilling, waiting for me. I'll find him. And um, yeah, that's, that's all I have to share. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Uh, okay, next our storyteller is John Graham, who is a registered nurse at Mass General Hospital, and he's also a member of the Snotbot Ocean Alliance team. So welcome, John Graham. I've never done this before, so I'm a little nervous, so bear with me. Um, I'm probably going to read most of mine, so apologize. But... Um, <clears throat> common household bathtub holds approximately 60 to 80 gallons of water. Used not only, talk louder, is this, is that good? Oh, Jesus, holy. Um, a common household bathroom holds, bathtub holds approximately 60 to 80 gallons of water. Used not only to cleanse the day's grime away, but to soothe aching bones and act as the vessel which Calgon will take you away. On one particular day, a number of years ago, after working my usual 12-hour shift at the hospital, I ascended the old wooden worn-out stairs to our third-story walk-up apartment. It was early, so I expected my girlfriend to still be sleeping. But upon entering our flat, the stillness was broken by my name hauntingly called out. As I made my way to the bedroom, thinking she is most likely still snugly tucked in bed, I instead found it vacant. However, at the far end of the room where our bathroom was located, I spotted her. She was sitting, knees pulled up to her chest, arms wrapped tightly around her legs in such a fashion that is to invoke the image of a pocket watch wound too tight, that if she were to release them, her whole body may possibly spring apart into pieces. A faint salty residue on her cheeks and reddened eyes belied the story of a tumultuous evening. Except for a slight rocking motion, she appeared frozen, almost catatonic. Oh, did I mention? She was fully clothed and in a completely dry bath bathtub. That tub had somehow been her safe haven in my absence. Her history with depression and anxiety had laid dormant for several years placed in a form of stasis with the help of therapy and medication. It, however, resurfaced with a vengeance in the wake of a serious illness of my own. Her strength and fortitude during one of my darkest times had depleted her of her own protective mental barrier. What was to creep back into her life would grab hold and remain a tenant of her soul for the next 12 or so months. My upbringing prepared me very little when it came to dealing with mental illness. In our household, simple cliches like you just have to pick yourself up by the bootstraps. And sometimes you just have to play with the cards that you're dealt. Or th thought to be the remedy for depression. 
sweeping things under the rug had, over the years, just created a lumpy rug. So it's not a surprise that trial and error had become my form of education in the arena of mental health, and I learned that sometimes cliches or even any amount of gentle, encouraging words while she was in the dark world provided only the faintest of light, not enough to comfort the agony brewing beneath the surface. In the years leading up to this moment, when a panic attack would take a hold of her, I would try anything to relieve the pain she was experiencing. I thought I could just put on the proverbial red nose and big shoes and tell jokes. I might elicit a smile that would break the evil spell. I mean, isn't that what they always say? Laughter is the best form of medicine. I wish it were true. Now, the act of being present on face value seems like too simple of a concept to have any real effect on the situation that I faced at that moment as I sat on the cold tile floor beside the tub. However, only past experience has taught me that the simple act of being present is sometimes all that is needed, or should I say, all that one can contribute. Being in the medical field, I spend my days caring for the well-being of complete strangers. Yet I feel as if I'm completely inept when it comes to alleviating the struggles looming within the mind of the most important person in my life. On that day, even the emptiness of the tub could not compete with the hollow void that existed within her at that moment. I remain present with her that day and will forever, for I know she is more. Anxiety does not define her, yet follows her on her journey through life as a fellow passenger on a long flight that occasionally kicks the back of your seat just to let you know they're still there. That day is a distant memory, yet carved deep within my heart. For I see her for so much more than her depression and anxiety. She is beautiful, talented, and smart. She is the true definition of love. She is my wife, and she is my life. Ironically, at the same time that I sat down to write this, I'm remodeling our bathroom. <laughs> and I'm taking out an old shower stall and replacing it with a bathtub, something we haven't had in years. My, amaz <clears throat> my amazing wife, who works hard on a daily basis to keep the darkness at bay, deserves the world. But for now, an occasional soothing bubble bath might do it. I look forward to the day that she will be luxuriating in that tub and reciting the words of our beautiful two-year-old niece, Mo Bubbles, Mo Bubbles. Thanks, John. Mo Bubbles. I'm, I'm in that camp, Mo Bubbles. Okay, our next reader is Karen Pischke. Karen is a Reiki teacher, a registered nurse, a hypnotherapist, and she's also the owner and manager of Dreamtime Wellness. Can you hear me okay? Is that good? Yes. Closer? Oh, thanks, Anita. So I may also have to read from notes. This is my first time, and this is a story about synchronicity and ganan. It's a Japanese word for patience and perseverance. So for those of you that don't know, Reiki Ryoho is a Japanese healing art. And about 10 years into my practice, I met a teacher from Kyoto, Japan, a Buddhist monk, Hyakuten Sensei. And I went to a training he held in Toronto, Canada. And while there, the host, Elisa, had said that she wanted to travel to Japan to visit Sensei and tour the Buddhist temples. So I said, when you go, let me know. And she said, well, I'm thinking maybe 2010, 2011. So January of 2011, I think I hadn't heard from her, so I call her to see if she was still thinking of this trip, and she said, I forgot you wanted to go. We are going, and there's a group going from Toronto to Tokyo on to Kyoto in March. If you can match our itinerary, you can join us. So I frantically get online and try to find matching flights to 
Tokyo, a hotel in Tokyo, onward to Kyoto, and I matched them identically until the hotel in Kyoto. The hotels are fully booked because it's Sakura. It's the Japanese cherry blossom festival. Millions of tourists go and there's no rooms to be had. So I think, oh, I'm not going to be able to go. And then I think, last minute, late at night, I plug in my search hostel in Kyoto. And up pops a hostel. And I think, great. But it's all in Japanese kanji. So I can't read it and I can't tell if it's legitimate. And again, I think, I guess it's just not meant to be. And then I think it's 10.30 at night. That's only 5.30 in Hawaii. If I could find a travel agent, maybe they could help me book this flight and see if this is legitimate, or book the hotel, the hostel. So I Google, again, travel agent in Hawaii. And I call Regal Travel Agency. It's 5.30 in Hawaii. And a woman answers the phone and she said, it's so weird. Normally I'm not here after five and I wouldn't answer a phone, but I felt like I should answer your call, this phone call. And it turned out she was a Buddhist meditator for over 25 years and had a friend in Japan and she said maybe she could help us see if this is legitimate. So sure enough, her, fan, her friend finds out it's a brand new Ryokan hostel and they book my flight. And I think, great, it's meant to be such synchronicity. And I'm so excited about going. And then that was February 2nd. March 9th, I get a phone call from my mother. What are you going to do about your trip to Japan? I said, what do you mean? She said, there was an earthquake. And I said, well, there's lots of earthquakes that happen in Japan. They have earthquakes a lot there. Not to worry. I'm sure it'll be fine by March 29th when we're supposed to leave. Then March 11th, disaster strikes Japan. It's the 9.1 magnitude Tohoku earthquake and tsunami. And I prayer, pr offer prayer for the people of Japan and I wait, not knowing what this is going to mean. The next day we get reports of radiation leaking from the Fukushima nuclear plant. And again, I offer prayer for the people of Japan and I wait. March 16th, the U.S. State Department issues a warning asking people not to travel to Japan and suggesting people in Japan leave. Again, I wait. Then I start to look into radiation websites and I find out there really hasn't been any spikes of radiation in Kyoto. I consult with nuclear oncologists nuclear cardiologist, radiation oncologist, and they tell me that it's really a matter of time and distance, so I'm not going to be there that long, and if I'm not that close to Fukushima, I should be okay, and they encourage me to go. But maybe don't go to Tokyo. Maybe just go to Kyoto. So my teacher emails me and says, why aren't you coming? Kyoto is safe. So finally, March 23rd, I contact Elisa, who hosted him and has planned this trip. She also has been waiting. Everybody else on this tour canceled. And we realized the fourth disaster for Japan was the financial one, all the businesses and tourists pulling out. So we decided we should go in support of the Japanese people and to practice Reiki with our teacher. Part of Reiki practice is reflecting upon the Reiki principles or precepts, and it's kyo dake wa, today only. Shinpai suna, do not worry. Ik karuna, anger not. Kansha shite, with thankfulness. Gyo wo hagame, work diligently. Hito ni shinsetsu ni, be kind to others. So it's our, our practice not to worry. So we change our route to go directly to Osaka and on to Kyoto, further away from Tokyo and Fukushima. Mm -hmm. And now our itinerary matches exactly. We meet in LA and travel to Osaka and Kyoto. And now there's a hotel available, but I'm staying in my Ryokan. And when we get on the flight together, 
it's eerily quiet and almost empty, and we're the only Westerners on the flight. So we go with this idea of Ganan in mind, patience and perseverance. But what we're about to witness is the deeper meaning of Ganan, and it's the Japanese people enduring the unspeakable with patience and perseverance. And it's a much tr different trip than we had expected. Instead of millions of tourists being there for Sakura, the temples are nearly empty. The shoe racks have no shoes in them. The parks have nobody at the tables. And we move easily through Japan. And we're there to support the people. Strangers coming up to us, asking us, why are you here? Aren't you afraid? And in response, I would ask, are you? Should I be? And you could tell that they were afraid. But you could also tell that they felt the support from us being there, honoring and respecting them for their sense of ganan. So, thank you. Our last storyteller is Anita Pandolfi Ruckman. And uh, Anita is a therapist, a nurse practitioner, a massage therapist, and also the owner and manager of A Tender Place. So please welcome Anita Pandolfi Ruckman. What a crowd. Wow. The door. Good evening, everybody. So a year ago in September, I had the privilege of um, telling a story from this stage, and I decided to kind of do the follow-up to that story. So nobody has said that yet this evening, so I will say that I believe that the stories are archived, the fishtail stories. So if you like what you heard tonight, go on the Gloucester Writers' Center webpage and find all the other stories that people have told before. So it's really cool. So um, I really pondered on what, to, what story to tell. And I really didn't want to be too heavy. Um, so I decided to go with um, something that we might laugh about. So um, I uh, decided after I dropped out of college and did some explorations to apply to nursing school. And so I applied to Mass General Hospital School of Nursing. And, uh, when I went for my interview, there was this really tough broad who was the director. You know, she had the deep voice and the short haircut. And the, she said, you know, the hardest thing you're going to have to deal with here is the Harvard male ego. <laughs> and you know, she was right. And uh, I was up for a challenge, and they accepted me, a college dropout who wanted to be a midwife, but had to go to nursing school first. So um, I came from a Catholic, severely Catholic background, uh, educated by the good sisters for 12 years. And that was pretty tough. And then nursing school, I had no idea what I was in for. But we had to wear black stockings like the nuns and black shoes and a little houndstooth uniform with an apron because we were really the handmaids for the doctors. Does that phrase trigger anyone? Uh, and then a little cap. And Mass General is distinguished, or was, by their nursing cap. People are raising, are shaking. The nursing cap is in the shape of an ether uh, <laughs> mask. <laughs> because that's what they're known for, the first place in the operating theater to use the mask with gas to put people to sleep. So great thing, great, you know, for putting people to sleep and operating on them and healing them. So anyway, I get accepted. I don the uniform and I, right away, they put you in the trenches. You know, we're going to use you. You're going to be their workforce, even though you don't know a bloody thing, what you're doing. <laughs> but it's the intention, right? We're all there because we're going to heal people and we're going to give them good nursing care. 
So we had all these rotations we would be trained in. So I can't remember at this point. It's been 40 years now. I'm celebrating my 40th year as a nurse. So 40 years ago, there I was in my... <laughs> thank you. Um, we had the operating room rotation. So before they'd allow you in the operating room, you had to learn all about the operating theater. And so, and that's what they call it, right? It's the operating theater. So you have your costume, and you have to scrub in, and you have to know the etiquette. And as a nurse, if you're going to be there being part of the operation, you have to learn all the instruments. So we spent all this time in the classroom, you know, holding up instruments and naming them. And, and the most important thing was learning how to hand the instrument to the surgeon, right? And, and they said, you had to give it to him so he really knew he had it, <laughs> right? You had to slap it into his hand. There's none of this, here you go, doctor. It's because you don't want to drop that inside of somebody, right? He's got to have it in his hand. And it was a he. Un, you know, there weren't any she's who were operating on anyone in 1975 that I witnessed. So first day, the instructor takes us down into the bowels of the hospital. You know, you're probably three floors under the ground. And it's dark, and there's the corridors. And she has the OR list of all the scheduled surgeries. So for me, she picks out the case uh, the left large toe amputation. <laughs> we don't want anything too serious on the first day. So, but the idea was, and I never found out why the toe was being amputated, but it didn't matter. I was the lowly student nurse. I was told she dropped me at the door, just stand here and watch. You're not to do anything. You're not to be part of the surgery. You just observe, and then she takes off. So there I am in my black stockings and black shoes, and I have a, I guess I must have had a gown and the shoe covers to be in the OR. And the surgeons look me over head to toe and say, hey, uh, you came to, to participate? And I said, no, no, I'm just here to observe. Just go ahead. And they weren't going to have any of that. So they said, what's the matter? You scared? <laughs> Me? Scared? No, I'm not scared. Oh, yeah. I bet she doesn't know her instruments. She doesn't know her instruments. I know my instruments. So they held them up to make sure. What's this? What's this? And I knew every fucking one. <laughs> and excuse my French. So, uh, okay. So you're going to scrub in. No, I can't scrub in. The, my instructor told me I'm only going to observe. But... I scrubbed in. I wasn't going to let them intimidate me. So to scrub in, how many people have scrubbed in? Here we have a nurse's hand, and he's scrubbed in, and another one scrubbed in, a doctor perhaps. And so it's the ritual. You know, you go to the sink, and you got to spend so much time scrubbing up your elbows, and then this hand, and the nails. And then you walk into the operating room like this, and then somebody has your gown. and so. It's a dance, and actually we did it. And you put one arm in and the other arm in, and then you turn around. <laughs> no, right? You turn around so they can tie you up and back, and then you have to dive into your gloves. So there's the left glove <laughs> and the right glove. And then, then you really are gloved up and ready to go. So here I am, gowned and gloved and masked, of course. That happens before you even go in. So all you can see of anybody is their eyes. <laughs> and then the gown and the glove. And, but you could still see the black stockings. <laughs> that was the point. In the operating room, they could look down and see who the lowest person in the room, besides the poor patient, was the student nurse. So, uh, so I'm scrubbed in, and I'm handing them the, so they know they have it, right? <laughs> and, uh, and they're looking at me. The blue-eyed, the blue-eyed surgeons, I call them. And after a while, they're like, well, Ms. Pandolfi, what kind of nurse are you going to be? I'm like, I'm not going to answer these guys. 
I'm just going to not answer them. <laughs> They'll give up. So I didn't say anything. So then they're like, well, are you going to be a pediatric nurse? I didn't say anything. Oh, you're going to be an OR nurse. I didn't say anything. Oh, she's probably going to work uh, in, a, in a camp somewhere. And they go on and on. And then finally I said, oh, fuck it. I'm going to deliver babies, I said. And they, I could see their eyes widen even like this. <laughs> they didn't know what to say. She's going to deliver babies. Who is this weird? And then one of them says, why deliver babies when you can have them? <laughs> oh, look out. And I, for the first time in my life, had the response I needed. I said, I can do both. 